It is the biggest, smelliest grave on the planet. Want well, to have a little whiff? Inside, a rotting blue whale and a crew determined to take it home. One way or another, we're going to bring this thing up. To their shiny new museum. Putting the head up at this end. But broken bones. It's going to be a big job to put it back together. Stolen parts. Whoa! And a stew full of problems. That's not what we were hoping for. Threatened to bury the project. I can't see how this could go into the museum. And leave one man's dream. What have we gotten ourselves into? Of raising Big Blue. Oh, sh Dead in the water. This is the largest animal ever to live. One mouthful of food is half a million calories, the equivalent of about a thousand hamburgers. Its heart is the size of a small car. At 80 feet long, the blue whale weighs as much as a jumbo jet. For marine biologist Andrew Trice, getting close to a blue whale is an obsession. There's something up in front of us. Copied a little bit west of 210. It's phenomenal. It's a bit like watching a freight train go by, one car at a time. Finding the animals in the wild is difficult. Despite their size, blue whales may be one of the most fragile species on the planet today. I wish that blue whales were so abundant that you could say, you know, we'll, we'll find one almost anywhere. The reality is that they exist in all the world's ocean, but they're virtually extinct. Andrew knows it may not be long before the blue whale vanishes forever. Yeah, that was pretty awesome. Before that happens, he has a dream. Andrew wants to put a blue whale skeleton into a new museum that will feature two million specimens from the smallest on Earth to the largest. We've got room for anything from 80 to 90 feet. Construction of the BD Biodiversity Museum is already underway at the University of British Columbia. Andrew has everything he needs, except a blue whale. In British Columbia, there's probably fewer than 10 that still live off the shores of BC. In eastern Canada, it's in the low hundreds. It's such a rare, rare animal. And the opportunity to find one of them uh, when it does die is even rarer. Andrew has traveled the world, scouring many of the beaches where thousands of whales were killed by hunters. All that's left are the rusting processing plants that once pumped out millions of gallons of lamp oil made by grinding up whalebone and blubber. But blue whales do die and occasionally wash up on land. In 1987, this animal mysteriously appeared on a beach in northern Prince Edward Island. It had been dead for some time. The corpse was rotting, the smell overwhelming. Locals couldn't wait to get rid of it. It took two days and the biggest earth-moving equipment on the island to bury the animal. It was forgotten until Andrew Trites caught a whiff of the old story. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. He's flown across the country, hoping to find it. Good morning. Good morning, Sandra. Good morning. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. His first stop is with the local conservation officer. I'm the lady with the maps. Good. <laughs> well, we're really interested in knowing where the whale's buried. Down to the beach. Yeah, it's right in here. There is a great big mound, and that's apparently where the blue whale is buried underneath. There's a lot of dirt there. Several whales are buried on this beach, but only one of them is a blue whale. 
feel like I'm on a treasure hunt here. Got the map, got the X, and uh, hopefully we're gonna find our, our buried treasure here, our pot of gold. Andrew has two days to find the blue whale and figure out if there's anything left. This lead is Andrew's last hope of having a skeleton ready for the grand opening of the new museum. Now, just 18 months away. We're just going to poke a few holes here and there and see whether or not we can come up with a bone or two. The bones, if there's even anything left, could be extremely fragile. They buried about 160,000 pounds of flesh. You know, I think they probably dragged in belly down. But Andrew has brought Bob and Mike DeRoos along to help. Let's get him to do a lot more of this out yet. And then... The father and son team are experts at cleaning and assembling marine mammal skeletons for display. Let's start with the top layer. But a blue whale... Like digging up a dinosaur. ...will be by far their biggest project ever. And we really don't know what we're going to find. It was going to be just um, uh, bones nice and clean, which is what my vote is for, or whether or not it's at the other end of the spectrum, which is a lot of rotting flesh. It's a bit intimidating each time you see that thing come down. Whoa, you're just hoping. Whoa. Yeah, you hit it. Oh, my goodness. Which is a good sign. You think it was bone? Was the black just like rotten flesh? But is it the blue whale? The bone seems quite soft, is that right? This looks like it almost is in the ground for too long. Yeah. It has decomposed beyond the flesh and blubber. Uh, at least this part has, right? It takes several hours to free up what turns out to be a single large bone. So this is the, the right shoulder blade. A meter 75, unreal. The shoulder blade is the right size for a fully mature blue whale. Pretty unique piece. Andrew is confident he has his skeleton. This is every little boy's dream, right? <laughs> Being around like this. But back in the pit, where they've uncovered the widest part of the whale. You can just see the blubber that's still stuck to the outside. With every scoop of soil they remove, they expose more skin, more blubber. The red clay that dominates Prince Edward Island has preserved large sections of the whale. Very little has decomposed. It's funny, you know, we have these mixed emotions. It's like one moment we think, oh no. It's all disintegrated, and the next moment it's like, oh no, there's too much flesh on it. So I think it's still too early to tell exactly what we're dealing with. Andrew had hoped for a nice, clean skeleton, the kind of thing that could be dug up and shipped off in a few days. So there is still a lot of soft tissue around the, yeah. the bones of this animal. If it's got meat on it, then it means it needs to be carved off, and uh, the bones need to be cleaned and uh, uh, dried out and degreased. There's probably an awful lot of whale oil still caught up in these bones. It's the kind of work that will require a small army. Take up one layer of dirt at a time. But before Andrew commits to anything, he needs to know if the bones are okay under all that blubber. I'm trying to uncover a few ribs. It will take several hours before they expose the backbone. Okay, he can lift his bucket and some ribs. Look how fibrous it is, eh? Yeah. Yeah, the ribs are, are all bent backwards. I'm quite happy to see the condition of these bones. There's no indication yet that there's much damage to the, the transverse processes or even the ribs from what we can see here, and it's just a very small section. Uh, but the bones themselves look in, like they're in really good shape. Andrew and Mike know this is as good as it's going to get. We're going to go for it. We're going to try to dig this animal up. They close up the grave and decide they will return in the spring. Ground isn't frozen. It'd be a lot easier to get this girl out of the ground. 
Andrew may have found his museum specimen, but it's far more blue whale than he could ever have bargained for. What have we gotten ourselves into? Look at that, brand new shovels. <laughs> A team of ambitious treasure hunters has returned to Prince Edward Island's North Shore. So we think the tail is down here, and the head is 85 feet that way. They've discovered a long forgotten blue whale grave. The tip of the flipper. The tip of the flipper. On the right side. Marine biologist Andrew Trites wants to take the massive skeleton to Vancouver as the centerpiece for a new museum at the University of British Columbia now just over a year from opening. We've got a whole construction site, or maybe you should say a deconstruction site, that we put together, so uh, I feel pretty good about it. We know the whale's at least three feet below grade, so we're just doing the first foot and a half or so of soil, and then we'll go a little bit slower. Mike DeRoos and his dad, Bob, will lead an army of people who must excavate the whale. The last time they were here, it was in the dead of winter. The small part of the whale they uncovered was still wrapped in blubber and skin. Today will be the first time anyone has seen the entire whale in more than two decades. Nobody knows what happens to an 80-ton blue whale after 20 years buried in PEI soil. It'll be interesting to see what we find. Stick your nose in there. <laughs> I think we struck a whale. The odor in the warmer weather is staggering. It smells so strong, you can almost taste it. It's unbelievable. If you can just start bringing the pit this way. And they just get very quickly, progressively smaller, the vertebrae. It's great to, to see it starting to appear out of the pit. Their best hope is that only parts of the whale will still be covered in blubber, but... There is still a lot of soft tissue around the, yeah. the bones of this animal. We had a lot of discussions coming out about what would we find, you know, you're gonna find nothing, you know, everything has, has disintegrated. It's been 20 years to, um, you know, we're gonna find nice pristine bones, but nobody predicted that we're gonna find the whole whale. The red clay here is low in oxygen. It's prevented bacteria from growing and breaking the whale down. What the bacteria have failed to do now must be done by hand. Where are the gloves? The crew will need help from a team of pathologists brought in to separate bones well, from blubber. Let's see how hard it is. Retract the flesh, but leave the bones in place and don't take too much flesh off that the bones are gonna fall out. Okay. Um, but just enough so we can expose, document it all, and then we'll, we'll be removing them. We'll have to go slowly like this, small bits at a time. Pierre-Yves Dow has cut up and studied thousands of dead animals. But by far, this is the biggest. It's quite tough tissue, and the, and the nights are uh, getting a bit dull. That's our whale. I'm really hoping that we can get it done in, in 10 days. That's sort of our timeline, but I've never done this before. Each bone will be carefully cataloged. A blue whale only has about 190 bones, but parts of the skeleton are broken. They could end up with more than a thousand pieces. I think we should go label that last vertebrae first. The numbering system is critical if they're going to have any chance of putting this massive puzzle back together again. We're trying to capture all the large pieces from each bone as a whole piece, label that, and then label all the associated fragments that are big enough. And then we're keeping track as well of the ones that are too small, and we're just keeping them in separate bags so that we can later, when we put the skeleton together, know sort of what happened. It's always like that, just, a, just chunks at a time. More than 50,000 pounds of flesh will be slashed and hacked away in just the first few days. 
The bones that are coming out of the pit are heavy and seem to be soaked in oil. In the coming months, Mike will need to find a way to clean the bones. But for now, he's got his hands full just getting the bones out of the ground. We're still working our way up slowly from the tip of the tail up, but the bones are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Near the middle section of the whale, they've located the first flipper. It's in remarkably good shape. The bones on the flipper are not exactly like in our fingers where they're all perfectly lined up. Even though that's how they're often drawn in textbooks, uh, we suspect that they're, they're all set off at different distances. With more than 30 bones, many of them small, the team is lucky in this case. The flesh is helping to hold the tiny pieces in place. Which means that we're gonna be able to determine the exact placement of all those bones. But when the excavation moves to check out the other flipper, I don't know if that's a big blood vessel. the crew uncovers a nasty surprise. Holy sh The 12-foot flipper is gone. When Mike came back from the pit and said, you won't believe it, there's chainsaw marks where the flipper was, we knew we were missing a key piece to our puzzle. The ball joint, the bone that attaches the flipper to the shoulder, is all that is left. They check pictures taken the day the whale washed up. It's not very clear, but you can see here the flipper lying alongside the body. The question now, where is the flipper? Okay. The giant flippers were going to be a dramatic part of the museum display, and Andrew isn't interested in a lopsided whale. Because right now we've got a paraplegic blue whale. It's not going to be complete when we put it together. After six months of searching and digging, Andrew knows he may need to find another whale. This was quite a blow for us to discover that someone had already destroyed the skeleton. Mike DeRoos, his father Bob, and biologist Andrew Trites are trying to excavate one of the largest skeletons on Earth. We gotta be finished by a certain date, right? So we just gotta keep going until we are, right? This was once an 80 foot long whale that Mike and Andrew guess weighed about 80 tons. The whole animal is still there after 20 years and we've got more work than what we first thought. To make matters worse, this isn't even the entire animal. Its right flipper, more than 10 feet long, is missing. And then the flipper would have come off this, except that somebody's chopped it off. So when the whale died on the beach, it appears that somebody came down with a chainsaw, hacked it off, threw it in the back of a pickup truck, and it's probably stuck to somebody's barn right now. To find out that we weren't going to be able to put together the full skeleton, that was just a big disappointment. We're going to try to get the word out, see if anybody's seen a blue whale flipper somewhere that's in a PEI. Did you bury it or what? No. What happened? Within a day, a local named John Petrie shows up at the dig site claiming to know where it is. We're driving on the beach here and so we came across this flipper. I said, look at this. Somebody decided to cut this off. So I said, maybe on the way back out, we grab this flipper and take it home. Wow. So that's about the, the story on that. So I, grabbed, I took it home and Dropped it off in the woods. Hi, Andrew. We've got great news. Uh, there's a local fellow here who has the missing flipper bones. And this is the break we've been waiting for. I'm now going to go find out in exactly what shape it is and how many bones are there. Hi. Hello. I'm Andrew Trites. Pleased to meet you. I think you're our hero. Am I? I think so. <laughs> Hope I am. <laughs> oh, look at that. My goodness. These two pieces here. That, that's right where the chainsaw came across, right across oh, there. Yeah, right. The box is promising, but a blue whale flipper is made up of more than 30 bones. So this is the part here that was cut. When they sort through the box, almost half the bones, the smallest pieces, 
are missing. Any chance there's still some more of the bones in the woods? I've looked there two, three more times, but I couldn't couldn't find mm. any more, so. Okay. You just see how big this is. But even for someone, you know, to have cut off, that's really heavy, right? Yeah. It, I mean, it uh, must have taken you and a couple others to carry it. <laughs> Actually, it took, I think, four or five of us to put it in the back <laughs> of the for truck, so. Yeah. Andrew is confident he can recreate the missing bones, but they decide to search the forest where the flipper was dumped years ago one last time. There's where she lied, right here. Which direction was it? When were the bones like in a big pile or were they all separated? Uh, mostly all separated. Yeah, all in there. And within minutes, well, their determination pays off. Oh, look at that. <laughs> look how small this one is. It's got to be the smallest bone in a blue whale. That's right. Really small. Oh, here's another one here. They find all but a handful of the flipper bones. So that's a lot more bones than we had uh, this morning when we started yeah. out. Yeah. So now when we go back to the site, everyone's going to be very excited to see this. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. 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 This is... Yesterday was kind of a low point when we discovered we were missing it. Finding the missing appendage may have just saved the project. But back at the dig site, they have uncovered a new challenge. What they thought was a near perfectly preserved whale has been severely damaged. On one side, the skull had been just smashed. And that's gonna take an awful lot more work to put back together. The skull of a blue whale is the size of a small school bus. Its massive jaw extends forward more than 20 feet allowing the animal to feed on massive mouthfuls of food. The single largest bone in the blue whale has shattered into several pieces. The damage to the skull may be a clue to why a perfectly healthy looking whale died here 20 years ago. The leading cause of death for blue whales today is collisions with ships. It's a bit disappointing to see how much fracturing there is in the, in the skull. But on the other hand, it makes it a little bit easier to get it apart and get it all cleaned up. This is the last big bone. 24 feet long. Boy, I, I didn't imagine the bones were gonna be quite this big. After two weeks on the beach, the hole that once held the 80-foot-long whale is finally empty. Everyone say bone. Bone. Well, it's a bit of a relief. <laughs> I'm quite excited not to have to go back down into that pit anymore. I think all of us are just overwhelmed. Almost a point of exhaustion now as well. Just what it's taken to get this out of the ground. It's, it's a far bigger thing than any of us first thought it was going to be. More than 1,000 pieces were removed, numbered, and cataloged, each carefully placed in a refrigerated truck for a drive across the country. The Blue Whale Reconstruction Team has set up shop in a small seaside warehouse in Victoria, British Columbia. Mike must now come up with a plan to reassemble the whale. Yeah, it's still dead. And, uh... <laughs> Most of the flesh and blubber was cut away in Prince Edward Island, but the bones still are far from ready. These ribs don't look that bad on the outside, but there's still lots of oil on the inside, right? Getting the bones clean so they don't smell anymore is, is very, very important. The plan is to soak the bones in large tanks of oil-eating enzymes. A high-powered pressure washer is used to get rid of any blubber or flesh that is still sticking to the bones. We know that the bones will be clean when, when we don't see any of this uh, milky uh, slime coming out of them anymore. It's just like a oily, grease-laden sponge is what it is. This stage of the cleaning is only supposed to take a few days. But just a few hours in, 
Mike is getting nowhere. The oily bones are far more saturated than he ever imagined. See the pores, and that's loaded with the oil. Each bone can hold many times its own weight. Not only does the whale have a thick blubber layer, which keeps it warm and, and serves as an energy reserve, um, the bones also serve as a place where they can store oil, which is a high energy uh, compound in the body. But as well, um, you know, because these animals are living in the ocean, um, if they had a really heavy skeleton that was mostly um, hard bone, um, it would make them sink. So oil is lighter than water. And having that oil in these bones will allow the skeleton to be almost neutrally buoyant. The pressure washing has barely made a dent in the cleaning process. Mike needs the enzyme bass to work perfectly. If they leave the oil in the bones, the skeleton will emit a sickening, rancid odor that could last for decades. Not the kind of attraction that Andrew has in mind to draw in museum visitors. This pile of bones once belonged to an 80-foot-long female blue whale. One of the eight-footers, I'm gonna use it as a lever to lever this thing over. Opening day for the new museum, with the whale as its centerpiece, is now just a year away. So we have to get the oil and the smell and any organic material that's left on them off and get them nice and clean before we start putting it all back together. The bones contain much more oil than Mike had anticipated. There's still oil inside those bones, and I think we've got a bit, bit of a ways to go. We can't hang or put a well together if it's still oozing rancid oil. No one's going to want to see this museum. The key to the cleaning process is a massive tank built using parts from a hot tub. It's mostly water, and then to that water we add uh, enzymes and bacteria. We'll be heating it and circulating it and also keeping it aerated so there's lots of oxygen in the water, and, and those bacteria will um, digest the oil and multiply and hopefully do a really good job of cleaning the bones. This has never been tried on this scale before. We're very much making it up as we go along, yeah. And there's no instruction manual that comes with these things, so it's, it's kind of neat that way, though. It keeps us on our toes. About a third of the skeleton is placed in the first enzyme bath. We're good. If it looks like it's taking too long, we may build another tank. They will leave the bones to soak for three months. With the opening of the museum closing in, Mike needs this process to go smoothly. Well, I hope when we open these again, we'll see some uh, clean bones, or relatively clean. I think we'll clear it now. After 12 weeks of stewing in the cleaning solution, the tanks are drained. The bones are pulled out. Well, they look pretty scummy and gushy right now. They look pretty similar to when they went in, I think. But I mean, the surface of the bone looks, looks like it's in good shape, so that's, that's promising. So we haven't damaged the skeleton at all. Uh, but I think we're a long ways from having it cleaned. The enzyme bath isn't working the way Mike had hoped. It's my first close look at them, and it's a little bit worrying what we're seeing. Some of them are discolored, there's some black fungal growth on it, it looks like. And also, once we've drilled into it, there appears to be a lot more oil there than what we were anticipating. Mike is certain the bacteria is breaking down the oil, but the process is going too slowly. So these are them here? Frustrated, Andrew and Mike call in some help. I'm sure you noticed the smell when you got A team of microbiologists from UBC. Temperature when you're working with enzymes is one of the critical factors to try to keep at a fairly 
yeah. optimal value. Yeah. If they can get the enzyme bath to work better, they might still make the museum's opening date. I think we've caught it now at the right point, and now we need to figure out with our team of experts that have come over to help figure out this critical piece of the puzzle. What I was mentioning, Doug, it'd be nice to be able to take a few of these bones and run control experiments at temperature before, because right. that wouldn't take too long. That would only mm -hmm. take a few days to really yeah. see the outcome. Oh, we're more than halfway, and we're getting there. The biologists recommend turning up the heat from room temperature to a scalding 60 degrees Celsius. But it comes with a risk. It's a bit of a balance not to degrade the bones. If the solution gets too hot, the bones could be damaged. Perfect. Holy. That's incredible. I've never seen that much oil sitting on top of the tank. Within days, a slime appears on the surface. Within weeks, there's a thick layer of oil. The enzymes are finally cleaning the skeleton. How's it going this morning? But when the tank is drained, they realize they've just created a much larger problem. That is pretty soft, isn't it? Places. It's incredible. It looks like oatmeal. My heart just sank. Oh, that's not what we were hoping for. We've had problem after problem. We found a solution, and we thought we found this final solution to getting the oil out of the bones by cranking up the heat. And sure enough, the heat's released all this oil, but now it looks as though that may have created a new problem that none of us had anticipated. Another chunk fell off the bottom. Oh, The enzyme bath was too hot. The skull that was already badly damaged is now soft and mushy. Not only are we going to miss our opening day, we may not even have an exhibit. A new state-of-the-art biodiversity museum at the University of British Columbia will soon be home to two million specimens. The centerpiece is supposed to be an 80-foot-long whale, but before the skeleton can be displayed, the puzzle of how to clean the bones must be solved. People won't be able to come in and appreciate this. They're going to remember one thing about the world's largest animal is that's the biggest smell I've ever smelled in my life. The enzyme bath that was supposed to break down the oil has destroyed many of the bones. The skull, the most important and impressive part of the skeleton, is pretty much a write-off. The hell have we done? And we're feeling really, really bad about the whole thing. And the once rock-hard bones are disintegrating. I can't see how this could go into the museum. I can't solve this on my own, and, and I really I need some, some backup at this point to, to you know, talk me out of just walking away from the whole thing. You can see how, how soft those are. That is soft. I feel like I just crush it in my hands. You could. We hadn't expected this setback to discover that the skull is, is just uh, too badly broken down to be able to be put back together again. Yeah, we're going to have to replace this material um, with something Some when we rebuild it. Mike and Andrew now know they won't make the museum opening. Maybe this project was just foolhardy from the beginning. Maybe we're best to cut our losses and just bail on it and start over. But they decide to push on with some help from the world of dinosaurs. Can we show you? Uh, yeah, we might as well take a look at the skull your... since that's what we're going to work on. Gilles Denis is a paleontologist. He reconstructs large dinosaurs. This animal is probably the biggest one I've ever worked on. We're only working on a skull, yet that skull is sizable enough. Gilles is an expert at recreating damaged bones. Do you want mm -hmm. us to assemble the skull over there as one unit? Um, probably. His plan is to create molds of the mushy and damaged pieces. 
We're gonna apply six layers all together. More than 60 individual molds will be required to cast enough parts to create a replacement skull. We have release. Okay, a little further forward now. For the rest of the bones, Andrew and Mike have decided to abandon the enzyme baths. Yeah, there we go. We got her down. They've shipped in an industrial cleaner from Chicago. This doesn't work, nothing's gonna work, and, and we're just gonna end up with oil forever in our whale bones. The machine, called a vapor degreaser, is set up in an abandoned sawmill not far from the bone warehouse. We fill it with a special solvent that's non-flammable, um, just up to about this level, and then the solvent boils, and the, the vapor of the solvent, it's, it's about 70 degrees Celsius, um, rises up in the middle of the tank, and it creates this big cloud of hot vapor, and that's where we hang the bones. That's about 46 pounds, I'd say. So we'll have to see how much, how much it weighs in two weeks when we take it out. The hot solvent vapors should penetrate the bones and force the oil out. It's an expensive gamble that has never been tried on a blue whale. All right. Come back and see what they're like in a couple weeks. While they wait, Mike turns his attention to how the whale will be displayed. It's so important to get the planning done right because if something doesn't fit when you go to put it up, it's, it's gonna be a nightmare. <laughs> Every measurement must be accurate to the millimeter. Probably gonna be installing it just like a couple of weeks before they open the museum and it'll be impossible to go back to the, to the shop to, to make any major changes. Two weeks later, and Mike can't wait to check the degreaser. If this didn't work, the project is over. It's been more than a year since a blue whale was dug up in Prince Edward Island. It just keeps going and going. Andrew Trites and Mike DeRoos have been scrambling to get the enormous skeleton ready for a brand new museum. I forgot how many big bones we had. But problems cleaning the bones have delayed the opening. Uh, what can be done either to speed things up or keep it on track, or do we really have to start almost from scratch now? The bones are saturated with natural whale oil, now gone rancid. Nothing seems to clean them. As a last resort, Mike has brought in a massive degreasing machine. A batch of bones has been hanging in a cloud of solvent vapor for two weeks now. When we put it in, it weighed 44 and a half pounds. So what's it down to, Mike? 35. 35. So nine and a half pounds of oil came out. That's, that's not bad at all. That's amazing. That's whale oil. That's what it looks like 20 years later. It's the break they needed. It feels completely dry all the way through the inside, and there's none of those greasy patches left you know, on the surface. It doesn't stink. This seems to be working really well. The integrity of the bones is holding up great. It smells like bone. <laughs> 677. While the rest of the bones are vapor degreased, they start to reassemble and hang the skeleton. Beautiful. This is the list that I, that I go off of to determine exactly where all these bones are and where these hanging points have to be. As each batch of bones arrives, they're assembled using glue and steel braces. This is the very first bone to be glued on here. It's so exciting to see that like all the labeling and care we took in Prince Edward Island is actually paying off now. Looks like we got a blue whale skull there. Four months ago, a team of paleontologists went to work to recreate the skull that was destroyed in the enzyme bath. They cast 60 pieces and have assembled them into this. Huge. Mike is convinced that once the skull is painted, no one will be able to tell the replica from the real. Holy shit, this thing is big. Ooh, that door looks small. 
gonna just make it. The skull is more than 20 feet long, by far the biggest component of the skeleton. It barely makes it into the warehouse, and Mike knows the entrance he must use at the museum is even smaller. We're in, it's gonna be an awfully tight squeeze. It's another big, unexpected problem. Cutting parts off will be a nightmare for you. It's not the kind of thing Mike wants to do this late in the game. Why don't you two go and help tie up that piece? Okay. He puts off his decision for more than a month to moving day. Turn it that way. When the entire skeleton is loaded up and trucked to the new museum. If it's gonna be a very, very tight fit, if it doesn't, maybe we take out the saw and start cutting. I sure hope not. The smaller pieces are moved in first. Right down that hallway over there. They save the skull to last. The question on everyone's mind is, is the skull gonna go into the building? <laughs> it's a really big bone. So the moment of truth will soon unfold. I say 60-40, we we're gonna have to cut the skull. The skull is not only wide, but it's long, heavy, and awkward. OK, we're going to go down towards me. The skull is on a custom dolly that can spin like a barbecue rotisserie. I don't think you're going to get it in. It's too high. Just calm down, I'm please. I'm calm. I'm really calm. I'm just waiting, I'm not doing anything. Shh. I've, I've, they're, they're undone but in. When they try to push it through the entrance, it gets stuck on the top of the window frame. Can they go not any further at all? They won't be able to move forward at all. They can, but they won't be able to move forward. I think we may have to get out the hacksaw. We could tilt it more. Andrew knows cutting the skull will mean more delays. I don't think we're going to get that in here. No, not this way. We have to turn it in for it. OK, forward. They work nonstop in the cold and the rain for nearly two hours. You're watching the side, Bob? Whoa. But nothing seems to work. So we're going to tip it a little further? Until Mike decides to make multiple so adjustments as the over. whale is moved through the door. Okay. Stop, stop, stop. OK, let's get it in here. Sorry. Clamp it there. It's a dangerous gamble. The top heavy skull could spin out of control. OK, let's go. And smash on the steel pillar holding up the window frame. Slow. But the risky move pays off. OK, that's it. We, we made it. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. Good work, Ted. Yeah, thanks, mate. When I saw it that first time, it didn't look like it was going to go, but uh, spinning it made all the difference. This can rotate a little bit around it. Mike can now put all his time into hanging the whale. But the top of the skull is almost level. Like He's decided on a dramatic pose, with the fins back and the whale's mouth wide open, okay, as if lunging it. for a meal. You'll be able to stand up on the railing there and basically look into this humongous mouth. With a final length of 85 feet, they are now certain this was a female that likely weighed more than 150 tons. Definitely slow and steady with this. You only have one chance and you don't want to make any mistakes. Mike must make thousands of tiny adjustments to get just the right look. She's locked, loaded, and ready to go. Six weeks after the bones arrived and a year behind schedule, the whale is ready to be unveiled. This is it. We're here at the end of an incredible journey. We've got an incredible skeleton. Are you ready to see her? Yeah. yeah. Wow. Wow. <laughs> yes! Great.
For Andrew, this is the culmination of a lifelong dream. He knows that his blue whale will now live forever. People who knew nothing about this walk up to the windows in just this awe and amazement. And they look and they say, you know, it's so big, is that real? Is that a dinosaur? And it's just this opening point for a huge dialogue. And I never expected that. It's larger than life and it's gonna outlive all of us.